So one of the things we love most about living in Germany is there are so many fabulous ways to get around. So you can of course pick what is my personal favorite most of the time, a standard pedal bike, but this is not everybody's cup of tea. So then there's bike share, and in Freiburg we have what's called Frelo. So for about one euro, you can get 30 minutes of bike time to ride around town. But I have to say, when you have a little one with you, this is not really the most practical option. And then there's the regional train, which is run by Deutsche Bahn, which is a great way to get to and from different cities when you're commuting. But when you're traveling as a family, the ticket prices can become pretty expensive. And then there's the S-Bahn, which is Ashton's personal favorite. And us coming from the Midwest, this was the biggest breakthrough of our lives. However, two euros and 50 cents per trip can really add up when you're traveling with a family. And if your destination isn't right at the stop, you're gonna have to do some walking or you're gonna have to catch a bus, which can really turn this into a long endeavor. But worst case for some people is you can't actually take your bicycle on the S-Bahn with you. And if you really wanted to, you could take a taxi. Also a fun fact, Uber, even though it is a German word, is actually banned here in Germany. Um, another thing about the taxi, if you're looking to get one on the fly, you usually will have to have your own car seat with you, which is just a complete nightmare to try to carry around. And taxis are actually not the most economical or ecological option that you could choose. They can get pretty expensive. So finally, yes, you could own a car, you could rent a car, but there's one thing all of these modes of transportation have in common to get around town, and that's when you start having kids, they become infinitely less practical. So it's no surprise that 99% of the parents in the States, at least where we came from, chose to drive everywhere. But even in Germany here with its great infrastructure, sometimes driving feels like it's the most practical way. So what I'm about to make a case for is a transportation solution that checks all of the boxes. Easy to use, great for kids, great for all ages and train types, fast, efficient, highly adaptive, and cost effective. And because we should all be doing our part to leave the planet a little better than we found it, good for the environment too. All right, so let's dive into why I think this is going to be the most revolutionary mode of transportation of the 21st century. Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name is Jonathan and along with my wife Ashton and our son Jack, we are the Black Forge family. If you're new to our channel, beyond being a father and an avid cyclist, I have actually been working in the cycling industry for the last 11 years as a senior design engineer. And before that, six years working at a bike shop, racing bikes, working on bikes, and really just being generally obsessed with them. That being said, everything I'm about to share is my own research, my own thoughts, and my own opinions, and it has nothing to do with the opinions or position of my place of employment. Oh, they got me with their legal mumbo jumbo. But you know, really, I've been in this industry for a very long time. It's really now like almost half of my life, which is really crazy to think about. And you know, despite being the typical cyclist who does grueling long distance races and actually designing the bikes that are racing in the Tour de France, what I'm about to say might actually shock some people. Those lightweight carbon fiber aerodynamic speed machines that are my personal passion, they aren't necessarily the future of the cycling industry. In fact, I truly think that the future of cycling and our typical modes of transportation that will revolutionize the 21st century are e-bikes. So unless you've been living under a rock, you are probably now aware that electric cars are not just a fad, they are here to stay and they are currently revolutionizing the automotive industry. And while progress has been made in some areas, emissions from transport continue to rise. We're not going to get to net zero without dramatic changes to how we move about. And thankfully, e-technology is not just limited to cars. Battery technology is exploding and it's providing completely new opportunities for both the automotive and the cycling industry. And you know, with us living here in Freiburg, which is considered to be one of the greenest cities in Europe, it has been really interesting for us to observe this essentially a case study of how e-bikes and e-mobility are really kind of revolutionizing everybody's day to day. And you know, one of the reasons why e-bikes have come about is due to the climate. Freiburg really takes its climate goals seriously and the people in our city are passionate about the environment. It's one of the big reasons why we have twice as many bicycles as cars. But you know, there really are some legal implications here. European cities are extremely dense and they're continuing to grow and car use in these cities is actually being discouraged. 
For those of you who are not from Europe, our cars here in Germany are required to have an emission sticker on the windshield categorizing it based on its emissions. But here in Freiburg, they take it even further. Much of the old town here is not just green sticker required, but it's already mostly car free. And there's been a loud push to make an even greater area of the city car free with thousands coming out regularly on a bike protest, shutting down the B31. But as someone who works in the cycling industry, I can safely say that e-bikes were steadily growing for sure, but then COVID happened. And I don't think anybody in this industry was actually ready for what was about to come. Instead of the pandemic tanking our industry, the exact opposite happened. People got outside in numbers we have never seen before. Bike sales soared and e-bikes specifically took off. Whereas cycling used to be an activity mostly for those seeking fitness, we now had an entire new group of consumers who were just wanting to get outside and spend time together. Two years on, we are still playing catch up with inventory. And again, as somebody who works in the industry, all of these things together have changed the range of cycling products dramatically. So for example, Eurobike is the largest trade show in the world. And when I started working in this industry 11 years ago, this show was filled with performance bikes, racing bikes, mountain bikes, and then they started coming out with more e-bikes, which was basically just a carbon copy of this pedal bike, but now with a motor and a battery. And now the show is really kind of transformed into having e-mobility specific product. So two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, and do it all vehicles rather than just a bicycle to get from point A to point B. And you know, really the industry is growing significantly and looking beyond just traditional consumers that would purchase a bike at a bike shop for private use, there are now companies that are developing innovative and cost-effective solutions for commercial enterprises as well. There have been numerous studies that show delivery costs and time for companies like DHL and UPS have most of their expenses actually within the city centers. And this is now why many people are starting to use cargo bikes in urban centers. They are cheaper to operate, easier to park, and hey, you don't get stuck in traffic. And of course, for our German audience, this is no surprise. Deutsche Post has been delivering the mail in many, if not most, urban city centers by bicycle for over a century. E-bikes are not just for casual cyclists, but offer an opportunity to revolutionize other industries by making them more adaptive, responsive, and of course, environmentally conscious. So in the last section, I mentioned that thanks to COVID, families are spending more time together outside. But there are a lot of other benefits that e-bikes offer young and old alike. For starters, seeing the world from a bicycle is something more and more people are do thanks to the e-bike revolution. E-bikes have made cycling seemingly effortless and unintimidating for people less familiar with bicycles and those who are elderly or disabled. From easy to mount step through frame design and electric assist that can help them up a hill or even push assist when getting the heavy bike in and out of storage. And kids no longer have to stare at the back of the seat in front of them in a car just to get to school or run errands with mom and dad. Oh, it's so beautiful out here. Isn't it beautiful, Tommy? You know, dude. Tommy's a pretty lucky guy to be seeing the world at his age. There are now multiple options for cargo bikes or front basket bikes, school bus bikes, front and rear seat attachments for kids, and of course, trailers for towing your little ones in all weather environments. And you know, really where we are now, I take Jack to Kita every morning, which is a about 20 kilometers away and I'll get there in 40 to 45 minutes with a road racing bicycle without a battery with him in a trailer. And if Ashton has to drive, it takes her about 35 minutes. And Jack loves it. He feels like he's part of the journey and instead of him spending a big chunk of his morning sitting mindlessly in a car, he's looking at mountains, spotting tractors in the fields and commuter trains as they rush on their way into the city. He's more aware of his neighborhood and can navigate his way around. Yeah, now I know I am very privileged to live in a part of the world that actually prioritizes cycling. Freiburg has an incredible network of separated cycling routes, Fahrradstrasses, cycling paths integrated into intersections, and available bicycle parking at most destinations with even some providing e-bike charging stations. It's by no means perfect, and it's taken really a lot of work by organizations, nonprofits, and everyday citizens to advocate for it. But every year it gets better and better because more and more people utilize it as a safe and efficient way to get around the city. And that's been the story in many other major metropolitan areas around Europe as well. 
It's taken a lot of effort to reverse the effects of the car-centric planning, but we're getting there, and cities are starting to not only accommodate cycling, but plan for future growth as well. And I really think it's a model that North America could look towards for future development and redevelopment planning. You know, admittedly, the United States has been very slow on this transition, while Europe has been going strong for years. This is primarily due to the lack of infrastructure, very sparse cities, and a very strong do-it-all-by-car lifestyle. But Europe was once there too, and in the United States, it's slowly changing. We just need enough of the population that desires bike-friendly communities for local leaders and their tax budgets to make planning for it a priority. But, you know, even more than just providing the infrastructure, there are real benefits to the cycling-centric culture for the development of kids. By being on a bicycle, children learn mental maps of their own neighborhood, landmarks, street names, and when the time comes, they can easily transition to their own bikes, learning accountability, responsibility, and a sense of independence not typically seen until the age of 16 when we got our driver's license in the United States. And I'm not advocating for the end of the automobile. I personally love cars. Um, I just don't think that the bicycle is ever gonna be able to replace everything that we have to do. After all, while there are already some downtown areas in the United States that could reasonably add more bike infrastructure quite easily, a lot of the United States looks like this. Sprawling concrete mega parking lots with big box store buildings that are placed precariously far apart from one another. But I do think that there are millions of families out there that could reasonably downsize from two cars to one with the introduction of e-bikes. And for those rare occasions where you do need more space, there's always a car rental, a car share, car subscription plan, which is really more economical anyway. Of course, there will always be some situations where a family really does need two cars. It's great to have the car as an option when it's one degree Celsius spitting rain and you just want to get to work without catching pneumonia. But let's be honest here, those days are not frequent enough to warrant a second car. And as the Germans like to say, there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Hi guys, before we dive deeper into the opportunities of e-mobility, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about security. As part of Jonathan's job in the cycling industry, he travels all around the world, from ride testing with the pro teams in Europe and South Africa, to spending weeks in the factory in Asia, overseeing manufacturing and testing. And with all of those global locations, he's logged in to probably thousands of different networks, but he's also experienced firsthand just how dangerous that can be for cybersecurity and private information. Imagine going into a hotel lobby for a cup of coffee and connecting to a free Wi-Fi named Hotel Coffee Free Wi-Fi, which looks totally normal and not out of the ordinary. However, it turns out that the Wi-Fi is actually being hosted by a random person trying to impersonate the free Wi-Fi access. While you enjoy that free Wi-Fi and a cup of coffee, he has access to your data as he created that same network you're using on his own PC. So when you connect and go into the banking system you usually use, the information then flows via the man in the middle, the imposter device, and he can capture the information you entered. Uh, and unfortunately, we've actually personally had to learn this lesson the hard way. That's why we always look for lock and HTTPS near the destination URL and use a VPN to protect ourselves when traveling abroad. Being careful is key, but accidents do happen. And when it comes to devious attacks online, you can't find a better ally in security than today's sponsor, NordVPN. We were actually really excited to partner with them because we've been loyal customers of theirs for years. Right now, if you head over to nordvpn.com forward slash black forest, you can get four months for free on a two year plan. Plus, if you decide you don't like it in the first 30 days, there's a money back guarantee. But I have a feeling you're going to love them just as much as we do. So thanks NordVPN for sponsoring this video and our channel. Cheers. And ultimately, there are real economical advantages in addition to being better for the environment. Let me give you an example. A new e-cargo bike can run you between five to 8,000 euros, depending on the brand and extra add-ons. And while that might seem like a lot of money to spend on a recreational toy, as many Americans often see bicycles, 
Spending that much on a used car would be seen as normal or even frugal. And yet the cargo bike has a lot of features that make it equal to or even better than a car. For one, it doesn't take any gas. I don't have to insure it for as much as I would have to insure a, a car for. And I can actually put a car seat in the cargo bike for a very small child. Kids love them, dogs love them, they're easy to clean, and they are a heck of a lot of fun to rip around on. You know, even if the cargo bike isn't for you, there are a lot of brands and styles that are entering the market at reasonable prices that can help get your foot in the door. There are e-mountain bikes for those who are looking to rip around on trails or downhill tracks. There are e-folding bikes for those commuting longer distances by train. And to take this a little bit further, there are actually e-bikes out there for passionate hunters who are trying to get to their tree stands. And yeah, sure, use an e-bike. And you know, at the end of the day, I am a performance-focused cyclist. I did a lot of races back in my day. That makes me feel pretty old. You're old. Um, however, I do own an e-bike because I use it just from getting from point A to point B. And I don't think you always need to have to prove your fitness level if you're on a bicycle. Sometimes it's nice to just get somewhere. And to be honest, American elitist cycling culture has been shunning e-bikes for years simply because the cycling culture is completely different. People earn their fitness and their ability to ride the trails and they feel people are cheating and enjoying these perks without putting in the work. I completely disagree with this. Um, I think the more people we put on bicycles, the more people we can get on trails is only going to benefit everybody who is on a bicycle because this is going to invest more money into maintaining and building trails, for example, and also to create safer routes for those of us who are trying to ride through a city. And you know, we've spoken time and time again that we feel safer cycling in Germany because drivers are more aware of cyclists. They expect them to be there because normally, well, they are. And that driver is likely to also ride their bike from time to time and they understand the effects that awareness makes on everybody's safety. And I get pretty disappointed when I read articles showing careless cyclists and dangerous situations. Articles like this one have been advocating for outright for bidding them or requiring bike training like a special license to use them. And I think this is the absolute wrong approach. Yes, we do need to understand the rules, but this goes with every type of activity. And at the end of the day, the problem is deeply seated in lack thereof or poorly executed infrastructure, not the cyclists trying to effectively navigate their city. When bike paths are an afterthought, cyclists are forced into sharing road with car traffic at much, much higher speeds. When more citizens in a community ride a bicycle, we advocate for the creation of infrastructure that can be easily navigated with separated paths and help cars and cyclists live together. And you know, at the end of the day, as many people are probably gonna say in the comments, yes, I agree, there are many cyclists out there who are very bad at following the rules but so are many motorists. We've all seen our examples of idiotic driving. And when a car fails to follow the rules, the consequences can be much more severe than a bicycle. But that's enough about cars. We're here to talk about e-bikes. And that being said, if we're gonna be talking about policy planning, I think there is one area that Europe could really improve on. Speeds on e-bikes are restricted in the United States and in Germany, but interestingly, they are actually different. According to the EU and UK law, e-bike maximum assisted speeds is up to 25 kilometers an hour, or about 15 and a half miles an hour. E-bike riders can still pedal their bike faster than this, but the bicycle isn't allowed to provide electrical assistance beyond this speed. But interestingly, e-bikes are allowed to go faster in the United States at 20 miles per hour, which is about 32 kilometers an hour. Personally, I think the 25 kilometer an hour in Europe is a little bit too slow. And the reason I have here is when I'm riding my e-bike down a residential street, the speed limit is 30 kilometers an hour, but I am stuck at 25. And if I have a car behind me, the five kilometer an hour difference isn't very much, but they're still gonna feel the need to pass me. But the problem here is they don't actually know how fast I am going. So the passing maneuver is often a little bit longer than it could be but I think in reality it would be safer if the e-bike was going the same speed as the car and then there was no need to pass. And yes, of course, being at a higher speed does not mean you have to give up situational awareness. If you're on a bike path, that doesn't mean you have to go this fast. You should only ride 
as fast as you think you can safely be with those around you. But again, going with the flow of traffic is safer for everybody. Um, one more point I'll bring up here are high-speed e-bikes. Yes, they're available and they will go about 45 kilometers an hour, but they have a completely different set of regulations and you now have to put a license plate on them. Um, and if you're choosing to get one of these or a normal e-bike, um, I would recommend looking at the link down here and you can pick out a specific helmet that is approved for e-bikes. And you know, living in Europe has really opened my eyes for the potential of e-mobility and not just for me as a youngish guy, but for the mobility, the accessibility, and the safety of all the people in my community. Whether we're talking about climate change, business logistics, or just going outside and having fun, I truly think that e-bikes are the future of mobility. We are seeing a tidal shift in the cycling industry, and I'm really hoping that this can finally be the catalyst that is needed to get more people out of the driver's seat and onto a bike seat. All right, so before I let you go, I want to do a little poll in our YouTube community. I wanna ask all of you, do you own an e-bike? If not, would you own an e-bike? And what would you like to see done differently to better help you choose an e-bike instead of your car? Let me know down in the comments below. So if you liked what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So until next time, ciao.